Well, good evening, everybody, again. It's good to be here. Glad to be here. Glad you're here with me. I'm looking at a verse in the book of First Timothy. Um, Paul was writing to young Timothy. And Paul loved Timothy. And the Bible speaks of truth in this particular verse and as in all verses, but this verse here when I was inside, I always have a tendency to want a verse that just really speaks. And as I was reading, there's a lot of things that Timothy is hearing Paul say in the first chapter of the first Timothy. Um, the verse that really is a loaded verse. This is a verse that is full of preaching. It's full of a message. I don't know that I could do it justice tonight. I never feel like that I could do a message justice, especially when it has so many unique words in it. It says, it says in verse 17, I'm in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17. Now unto the King Eternal. Now unto the King Eternal. See, Paul knew the King Eternal. Paul experienced the King Eternal. That road to Damascus that day that he was on allowed him to experience the King Eternal. You know, I'm sure that if we had the Apostle Paul here tonight and we could interview him, I guarantee you he would let the world know just how much it meant for him to say the word, the King eternal. If you notice in my Bible, at least in my Bible that I'm using, and I use the King James, now unto the King, the capital King, the King eternal. You know, anytime you look at punctuation in the Bible, you see the value of what Paul was saying here. I don't think that he just coincidentally wrote it in the way he wrote it by putting and not highlighting the king. And this is his way of highlighting the king is the king of glory. Uh, it's just, it's mind boggling. To read it, now unto the king eternal. This king lasts forever. He was before the beginning. I mean, it, there's a place in the Bible where it talks about he's the beginning, he's in the ending, he is alpha in the omega. Before there was a beginning, he was the beginning. Before there was an ending, there was a, a ending. And he just gives us the pleasure and the opportunity to just come out here and just read the scripture and what he's saying here when he mentions that he is the king eternal, the everlasting eternal king. The king that reigns over every body of water, every dry morsel of land, every government that is in this world, that has ever been in this world. He is literally over all things. He was over all things in the Old Testament. 
And yes, he's over everything in the New Testament. Does he allow man to run things? Yes, he does. But he's ultimately in control. Uh, this king eternal is able to control nuclear warheads. He knows that nuclear warheads will end up blowing up the planet. And he's able to be king eternal even over the earth that he created. So he is ultimately in full control. He is in control of eternity. Eternity he is in control over. That's the reason he is eternal. It uses the word here, immortal. That word immortal means that he can't die. Anything that is eternal can't die. Now, yes, they put Jesus on a cross, but Jesus had to go to the cross in order to pay the payment for man's sin. That was the only way that man could end up going to heaven is by the payment that Jesus made on the cross of Calvary. So yes, he went through a death, but he was also raised in victory over that death. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See, God raised him from the dead. He didn't stay dead. This God, the king that I'm referring to here, is the king over all things. He's even king over death. He's even in control of death. That blows, that probably blows a lot of people's minds, but if he didn't control death, then how could he control the death that was back in the Bible? If he's not in control of death today, can he control the death of what happened back in the Bible? God needed a sacrifice and Jesus was the only thing that could pay for man's sin because it was the only thing perfect to pay for man's sin. A lot of people think that man can pay for their sin by their ability to live a good life and to live a sin-free life. Well, good luck with that. Because just as sure as you think that you are sin-free, believe you me, there will be somebody to come along that will jerk the rug out from under you so fast and it very well could be the man himself, the man of Satan, could actually jerk the rug out from under you. The, this king eternal is immortal. You could shoot bullets at him and bullets wouldn't even penetrate. Bullets wouldn't even feel like a little mosquito bite. Did he feel the nails in his hands when Jesus went to the cross? Yes. Did he feel the crown of thorns on his head that was poking him in the head with all them thorns in his head? Did he feel them thorns? Yeah, he did. Did he feel the whipping on the back when they beat him and beat him to a pulp? Yes, I believe he felt every one of them. You know, them, them cat of nine tails was like claws on the end of the one lashing, and it had like five or six metal shards of glass and metal and pointed things that when that soldier would throw that whip, it would be like a cat's claw that would sink into the skin. And here's the horrible thing. When the soldier would take it away, it would literally release the skin and it would drag the skin with it and it would pull the skin to the point that it would literally rip open his backside. I think one place talks about where the Bible says he was unrecognizable. They pulled his beard. 
the horror of him being, I guess, almost naked on the cross. But yet he was still willing to save that one man that cried out to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was still in the saving business right up to the very last. Did he want to save both of them thieves? Yeah. Only one recognized the Lord. Only one realized that this man here was immortal. Even though Jesus was going to the cross, Jesus was not going to stay on the cross, that it was going to, it, he was going to be put in a tomb, and in three days, God was going to raise him from the dead. Now, granted, a lot of them people back in that day didn't really believe that when Jesus died, that he's in the grave to stay. But God had other plans because God had plans when the moment he died and he allowed the sky to get dark and them soldiers was able to say, truly, this man is the son of God. They knew they had messed up because they had killed the living God or far as the living God as they saw him on the cross. But when they took him down, they wrapped his body and they put his body in a tomb. Normally, they would have left it out for the birds to eat off. That's usually what they did with people that would be hung on a cross. They would leave them there for the birds to take care of the of the of the body, but they didn't do that. No, the Bible says not one bone were, were, was broken in his body, not one. See, God had that plan from the foundation of the world, the king, the one that is over all things, that allowed his son to be immortal as well. See, God sent Jesus to the world to pay for man's sin debt. And the reason that I can come out here even tonight and read this verse to you is because of the fact that God had put life back into his son to the point that even Nicodemus and even Joseph of Arimathea was to take him to that grave. But then it was, I think it was Mary and the other Mary that went to the tomb and they was looking for Jesus. And I think they ended up seeing the gardener and, and I think it was Jesus that told Mary, don't touch me yet because I haven't been to my father. I haven't been glorified. But he commanded her to go and tell the others. And two of them came. And when they got back there, they didn't really see anything, so they left. See, this story that I'm telling you is talking about the mortal king. See, the devil thought that by nailing Jesus to the cross, that would be the end of him. But had he would have known, and that shows you right there that he didn't know everything that was going on. He didn't know. Had he would have known that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, he would have never allowed Jesus to die in the first place. He would have ne never had him anywhere near Jerusalem. But see, this was a God thing. God wanted Jesus to go to Jerusalem to be able to go to that hill that he was able to take that cross up that hill and had help to get that cross to the rest of the way in order for him to have the nails put in his hands and the nail put in his feet and the bri briars on his head and all of the abuse that he went through just so that you and I could be able to say today that he is immortal. You know what the Bible also says? He is invisible. Think of the times that when the invisible God showed up. I can think of one right now. Remember when the children of Israel marched off on in the Red Sea, the invisible God had opened up the water. And when it was time for the invisible God to remove the barrier of the water, 
to allow it to go on the Egyptians, then the invisible God moved the barrier. Then people actually went through the water thinking that if the children of God went through, then we can go through, but they was sadly mistaken that the invisible God had showed up. I'm glad that God is invisible because the God that's invisible is able to see all things and there's nothing that he cannot see. But yet he is invisible to our eye, to our naked eye. He is invisible. This Bible verse says the only wise God. I read in one place here where the man has a tendency to say it would have been better translated. Well, maybe so. But I want to take it as what it says right here. The only wise God. There's only one God. If I'm questioning that God has to be wise, I'm already messing up because he's already perfect. There's only one God. Did the scripture have to say the only wise God? Is he letting man know that he is the wise God, that he makes the decisions that is wise in his own eyes just because man don't see it? See, this guy over here in this study Bible can say that it would have been better translated. What about the fact that this Timothy needed to be able to see the kind of God that he was. He was the only wise God. To young Timothy, there could have been more than one God. But according to Paul's writing, he is the only wise God. He was writing this to Timothy. He was writing it to young Timothy for Timothy to understand that God was a wise God, the only wise God. See, there was going to be times in the scripture where Timothy, no doubt, was going to be bombarded with all kinds of gods in his day. See, Paul is getting old here, and Paul's going to be off the stage someday, and he's just really trying to encourage Timothy with the truth that, look, you need to be careful when someone else comes in and brings another go a gospel that there's only one wise God. There's only one. And that's what he was telling Timothy here. So I can understand why he would have said there's only one wise God. Because I think that even, even Paul here that wrote this verse, let it be known that there's only one God, just one. And then it says, be honor and glory. See, I'm supposed to honor God. You're supposed to honor God. We're supposed to honor God, and we're supposed to give him glory, be honor and glory forever. My The time that I give him glory is the time that I recognize this God eternal that we just talked about up here, the eternal God that deserves honor and glory forever and ever, meaning for eternity and for eternity. When I pray, I have a habit of saying amen and amen. You know what that word amen right here means? It means truth. Some people says it means so be it. But in this case right here, this amen right here means truth. God is the only wise God that is, a, is the truth. What God are you depending on today? Are you depending on the God of money, fame, fortune? All them is going to let you down. Don't depend on them because they're going to let you down. Depend on the one that can save your soul. Depend on the one that can love you like nobody else can love you. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Elderly Ministry is the website. There's a phone number there that you can call 
leave your name, leave your phone number, and I'll be more than glad to give you a call back. Share the video if you would. Holler at me if I can help you. I appreciate it very much.